All right, so today we're gonna do a little bit of an introduction to storyboarding. This isn't gonna be as huge of a digital portion as a lot of the other things we're doing today because this is more setting us up for everything else we're going to do over the next couple of days. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at this wonderful George Lucas quote because I felt left out of the Star Wars theme. So the, if students aren't taught the language of sound and images, shouldn't they be considered as illiterate as if they left college without being able to read and write? So a lot of what we're gonna think about today is how we can use these tools and how we can incorporate all of these things in a way students might norma not normally be exposed to to kind of give them that other edge and element that they can incorporate into all the different things they're doing and learning in their classes. So kind of when we're getting, talking to students and trying to get them to work on these sorts of projects, it's kind of letting all the different elements speak for themselves but also interact with each other in a way where they um, complement what you're trying to get across rather than, okay, this has to say every single thing every image has to have this exact meaning, and the text has to explain exactly what that means. So trying to create this overall multimedia project in which um, it's a very cohesive unit rather than separate, obvious separate things layered on top of each other. So has anyone have instances in their courses or projects they've done where they've really struggled with kind of this show, don't tell issue? You know, we oh, say yeah. papers and mods, so. writing. Yeah. Yeah, so it'll, it will come up a lot in a lot of what you do, so. There's, um, why storyboarding? Why are we focusing on this so much today? So it goes back to that idea that students are going to have that opportunity to um, map out all of these key elements and see how they can assemble them, fit them together, make them complement each other, rather than just going out and recording a video, then recording separate narration and trying to smush it all together into one final thing because they just think, oh, I'm making this video. Um, and really kind of distinguish them this, you know, in a way this is your video essay or this is, you're telling a story, not just, um, you know, here's all these different things, and look what I did. So, here's a lot of different uses of storyboarding. In some ways, people only think that they're really used for movies, but they have a lot of applications for different things. Um, one thing a lot of students might be interested in is, you know, letting them know, hey, your favorite comic books, this is how they're made. They'll lay out the different potential scenes. They'll lay out all the different dialogue and the action shots, and this is how they create that before they put it into the final panels. Um, but also businesses, essentially what a presentation board is a storyboard, right? They're either doing a marketing kind of pitch or whether they're just pr pitching a new product. They're laying out, here's our product, here's our idea, here's all the different elements that go with that and here are the steps we will take to complete that goal. Um, also in novels, authors are more and more using this idea of storyboarding. And um, so instead of just trying to plot chapter by chapter, um, a lot of writers will create little different cards of the key concepts and that allows them to rearrange, see what fits better, pair different characters with different scenes just kind of give them this more um, overarching way to formulate their ideas. So interactive media is also becoming more and more popular. Web design, instructional design, all these different things, just kind of plotting out all the different elements. So instead of just kind of a list of all the things that need to happen, here's the kind of the videos, the audio, all these different things that are going to incorporate the colors. So trying to think of things as a cohesive whole and figure out all the different elements. So particularly in software design, um, when people are plot programmers are plotting what they're going to do with their software, they have to keep in mind how that user interface is going to be useful to people who are, you know, um, the everyday people using this computer software. So they'll go through and be like, what would a user-friendly screen look like? So here's, so they might have the code or what they're attempting to reach with that board, but also pairing it with this idea of how is this gonna be helpful to our users. So then also a lot of scientific research uses as well. A good um, example is that linguists often use storyboarding to spark instances of spoken language so they can present a series of images or do something like that and then get um, reactions from people in their native languages. Um, some people I've seen online do it with like the scientific method, trying to you know, do all those different steps and how, what would go into all those different steps. So there's a lot of practical applications of storyboarding, even though we usually do think of it as just kind of a traditional video thing, which of course now we're going to use it to make videos, but <laughs> just an idea of how other ways you can incorporate it into class. So there's kind of three main steps here that we're gonna be looking at over the next couple of days. So not showing up very well, but this first one says select and organize your images. And um, the next step will be develop a script and narration for on-screen text and then identify music and visual effects. So we're gonna go ahead and break down those different categories and see what that really entails. So there's a lot of different things that you can think about when organizing your images. Um, they'll want to focus on the visuals of their stories, um, collect all of the different images, video, drawings, any sort of visual thing they may have and kind of organize them into a cohesive sequence so that they're actually, before you even add in the narration, they're making a logical story. And not all the gaps have to be filled in at this stage, but if they can sort it out just in their visuals, it's gonna help them you know, be able to tell that story later on instead of trying to fit a narrative onto a series of random images. 
So some of these, um, the, a lot of people will have templates online, which we'll get to later. Um, you can make them in PowerPoint, but you can also do them, you know, pen and paper. But there's also, if you want to put the videos and images in PowerPoint, have them describe it in there. You can, there's a lot of online resources. There's just many different ways in which you can organize these images in a way that works for you. So another thing is, is a lot of times when you're in a course, the students are going to have to be making some sort of argument or persuading you of something. So really thinking about how these images can help you make your point and not just having to explain over the top of them of how you're going to make your point. Once again, it goes back to show, don't tell, right? Yes, we know you're making the point and you're telling us you're making this point, but how are you giving us evidence through these images and videos? So with the script, um, once again, it's a matter of you don't need to tell us every single detail. If you have all of these elements working together, you will be... Um, um, if you have them all together, you will be kind of speak, the video will speak for itself, right? So some examples here, if you're introducing a new scene or a new subject or a new theme, you may need a little narration um, just to lead us on to the new change of topic. But ultimately, it's more of a complementary thing than a, just describing every single thing. So um, not necessarily a slice of narration to a slice of video or a slice of um, just image. You can, you know, a bit of narration can be cohesive over a few different things, or you can change topics if it fits for you. Um, it doesn't have to be a step-by-step, -step, this line goes here, this line goes here. It's really something the students can play with and make it represent um, their work however they want. Um, so one thing here is they say try to use active voice in simple sentences, because once again, if you're playing a video and you have an audience, it goes back to what um, we kind of said earlier about thinking of your audience, right? If these are projects they may potentially share elsewhere, um, I know with Conversation Toward a Brighter Future, we've talked a lot about having little galleries for um, parents, students, community members to come and see these videos. You're going to want to think of that wider audience. So while, you know, in some courses, like if they're doing a very specific project for their English language arts project, yes, it may need to be a little bit more complex than that. But it's really about considering your audience and how that narration will really speak to that group as a whole. So identifying music and visual effects. We're going to talk a lot about this later. Because you know, if you're going to post these online or share them, there are going to be some sort of copyright issues. Finding free music, um, recording your own audio, those are all things we'll cover later in the workshop. So, but you also want to keep in mind that while some kids might get really excited about the music and sound effects, there's a really easy risk of it overwhelming. So if you notice in the video we just looked at, she took, picked some very nice kind of under, mu underlying music that didn't really overwhelm anything. There weren't lyrics. It wasn't any sort of like driving tempo. So it complemented what she was saying and set the tone without actually overwhelming what she was trying to tell us. So another thing is um, with sound effects, sound effects can sometimes be really useful tools, um, but they can also overwhelm. So if they're creating a storyboard and they have a sound effect for every single image, they may want to reconsider that because if there's like some sort of transitional sound effect every time an image pops up on screen, once again, that will take away from what they're trying to tell their audience. So once again, have make sure they're kind of recording where they're finding their music and sound effects to make sure there aren't any sort of copyright issues if you are sharing them online. Um, and keep in mind how using all these different things can change the tone of something. Because even if you're narrating it and um, have the image, even if you play like some sort of spooky music under it, it's going to have a really different connotation than if you're playing some beautiful classical piece, right? So those are all things to keep in mind. So this is a really common activity that um, a lot of storyboarding um, introductory courses like to do with students. So in your folders, you'll find a sheet. There's two storyboard sheets. One has just six and one's front and back. We're just using the one-sided right now. So what we're going to do is I want you to pick your favorite nursery rhyme. I have a few examples up there. And then take about 15 minutes to storyboard that. What sort of elements need to be addressed? What images would you use to represent in these six scenes? If you're just making like a 30, 45 second video. What are the really the things we need to get across here? So just think about that. How are we going to show our stories rather than explicitly stating, this is this fairy tale you know, here's how we do it. Some of you look alarmed, this is supposed to be a little bit fun, don't worry, we're not grading you. I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. Draw something? Yeah, you can draw it or if you want to write a little concept, we're just, how would you portray the story of one of your favorite nursery rhymes? Or alternately, what would you want your students What would you expect to see them to put down? All right, so my first question for all of you is who actually did their images first? Okay, that was interesting. So why did um, 
some of you decide not to do your images first. Just out of curiosity, what? Go ahead. Make sure my storyline would fit in the boxes okay. inside it, so I had to kind of tell the story okay. first to make sure that my structure was going to lay out properly. It's interesting that you said you had to tell the story first, mm -hmm. and to you that meant the words, but to, some, I could, to someone else I could see that being like the, the images. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not confident as I go Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little of that too. What do I have to draw versus <laughs> what can I get away with? <laughs> so did, for the people who did do their images first, um, what did you think of doing your image first? Like, was that helpful? Did you find that difficult? Like, how did you go about that process? I kind of went in <coughs> first because the rule is show, don't tell. So then I decided to put my images and decide what had to be told. So then I sent it to my husband, a picture of it without any words, and he knew immediately what it was. So then I'm like, well, maybe it doesn't need any narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to talk about kind of their thought process behind their images? Go ahead. Well, I also thought, like, I knew the words I was going to use, you know, but I didn't know what images I was going to use, so I kind of had to bring some images so that I knew how to, like, how I wanted to section out the words or how I wanted it to sound, and also what meaning I wanted to make out of the words, because you really can go with so many different ways mm -hmm. with something as familiar as a section Yeah, because our narration is already there, isn't it, right? And that everyone knows. Go ahead. I started off the picture, and then I realized I was looking at a horrible PR. <laughs> But um, I kept thinking back to those when I was looking. My nephew's story box mm -hmm. and his rhymes. Most of them are just pictures. There's not any words. So when you read them to them, you kind of have to come up with your own narration. So mm -hmm. I kind of just use that. Okay. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Why they might have done one or the other? So these are problems we're going to run into with students, right? You know, some of them are going to be like, they're really familiar with what they want to say, and they're going to want to fill that in. And then they're going to try and kind of shoehorn in what images they think will get that point across, rather than kind of having it evolve organically, when it really is a really strong visual project. So we're going to go around and share your storyboards. Don't worry, no one's judging you on your drawing. No one's great, it's fine. So try and think of a few of these different concepts when you tell us about your storyboard. Why did you choose to break up the text in that way? Why did you pick particular details? You only had six panels. Um, whose perspective, like if you did Bob the Black Sheep, did you do it from one of the sheep's perspective? Did you do it from Shelby's perspective? Things like that. I and mean, then why did you add any images that you might not have traditionally thought of to get your story across? Um, and anything you cut out, does anyone want to share theirs first? I'll go. Okay. I did Mary Had a Little Lamb. I realized I didn't know how to draw a lamb. <laughs> but anyway, um, I did the pictures first because I was singing the song in my head and I and um, the images that I added to it that really aren't the rhyme, when it says it made the children laugh and play, I added a hopscotch, and then I added at the very, very end um, all the kiddos hugging the sheep to show that like mm -hmm. the, or the lamb <laughs> made them all really happy and they loved it very much. So, um, Did you have any notes on any sort of sound effects or anything that you might want to include? Yeah, or? I put in laughter at made the children laugh and play. And um, I added, like, in my head, I thought of making a separate um, box for fleets as white as snow, where you had, like, snow falling, if okay. you were doing it on, like, a computer. And then after hearing somebody from over here talk about telling it from a different perspective, um, I thought about how my students could have told it from Bowel her to school one day, it's Mary running to the school, school, and there's going to be a bell, ding, 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 and the lamb is like, wait, um, then was, was against the rules, so in that one, I'm going to have a lamb, and then a stamp, no lambs, like, you know, there was no stamps, <laughs> and then it made the kids laugh, and I have kids laughing, and the sheep is fine in the corner, 
and then um, they're laughing to make fun of Mary. That's uh -huh. where it goes the worst, you know, for <laughs> Mary. Um, she's crying, and she tells the sheep to go home, and then she goes off crying. Oh my God, <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. I don't know. I guess I, I, I interpreted the laugh and play differently. Uh -huh. I forgot about the line with the rules, too. Yeah. <laughs> So I was like picturing Mary being real upset, and I wanted you know her crying, and then if she's ever upset, the lamb followed her. She's definitely going to tell the lamb to go home, and the lamb's going to be sad. Oh, <laughs> like, 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 I'm like, doing I have playing <laughs> instrumental the song quietly, just but while I'm telling the story. So it's With a slightly be, dissonant note. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a like, note. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about this for a little bit, right? Because a lot of people have different experiences. Maybe they have personal things. Like, so how about some of you? Are there things you guys would have done differently? Are there suggestions you would make? You know, We all think we all know Mary had no love of the lamb, and a lot of us would think we would interpret it the same way, but just this year. So what do you think? Mary is upset, and Mary is traumatized by all the kids laughing at her. Aww. Yours is way funnier. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> There's also a mean teacher in it, right? Isn't it the teacher who says lambs aren't allowed to I don't. I just know that this is lambs against the rules. I remember that part. I always like, I sing it to the, my girls. And I'm like, why is it a big deal with the lambs? You know? There's a lot more to this song than I remember. <laughs> yeah. So I like ring around the rugby. Well, that's, so that's what I was going to say. Most of the nursery rhymes do have like dark, a dark, dark at the beginning. Yeah, the nursery rhymes are dark. I don't know if you can rhyme one. watch her, like she hears thunder, she stops, like automatically, and she freezes. And then have the rain start to come down on her, and she runs inside really fast, and she's like, you know, it's just rain sound, and she's looking out, and it's silent, because, you know, rain in the country, there's no sounds, really, animals or anything. And then the last thing, I have her yelling up at the sun, saying, really? Because, like, she'll do that, she'll 
talk to herself and she'll talk, you know, if it's like she'll look up and she'll say, really? She's like, really? you know, so she's really upset and uh, the son's looking down at her and he's like really sad and he can't do anything. So, uh, I only had six bases. So what's, what's the shortest rhyme I could think of? I don't even know if it classifies. Anything, we're making anything. Yeah, right there you go. So, what's interesting about that too is we could have easily figured out what that was, right, without the actual nursery rhyme itself. So that's really what we're going for here, is trying to be able to get those things across with some of those more abstract ideas and images and sounds and things, rather than just being like, this is great and go away. Does anyone else have anyone they want to share or get feedback on something they struggled with? I know they're nursery rhymes, but sometimes just trying to conceptualize, if you're trying to go in a certain angle, you can quite figure it out. Anyone want to share? I know Did anyone we, draw oh. a tuffet? Oh, I, I, I got started on Little Miss Puffin and I was like, okay, instantly, all right, what's a puppet? Curds and whey. She said that that was cottage cheese. <laughs> like, I just stopped. <laughs> well, how far did you get? I did, I did. I just drew the concept. So okay. my concepts were, I did figure that a puppet was probably like a tuppeted stool and I always like saw it that way. Um, why Miss Puffet would have like curly hair and like a mushroom hat um, <laughs> and that I guess the interpretation, only interpretation I added was that the spider is like visibly upset when Miss Muffet like refuses to sit next to it and runs away from it and he's like left in scene, he's just like rejection. <laughs> oh, a lot of animals getting yeah. sick. Yeah, I'm in the six correct? Yeah. So then what, what stopped you? What made you stop? Was it figuring out? No, I could, I mean, I just didn't draw the illustration. Draw the illustrations, okay. So, but, because there were just enough words in that nursery rhyme to fill in all the holes. So it's like, my first block, I put, this is Little Miss Muffet. Then the next one, Little, little, little Miss Muffet sat on a tuppet, eating her curds and whey. Along came the spider, and mm -hmm. sat down beside her, and Freddy Miss Muffet away was the last one. Okay, do we have any other Miss Muffets? Sorry, Matt, no tuppets. It's okay. <laughs> Well, how about, who did Baba Black Sheep? Do we have any Baba Black Sheep? So I didn't actually draw pictures. I just wrote a lot of description of what I wanted to find. Mm -hmm. um, and so my first one is just like introducing the Black Sheep and he like takes a bow. And um, whenever he's asked, have you any wool? There's like, like a cloud of commotion. You know, and then the next panel, he's naked, and he's got, like, little leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's got three, he's like, three bags right here. <laughs> and then the next three panels are where the three bags are going. So one's, like, a farmer, one is, like, uh, like the farmer's wife who's sewing, and then the last one is, like, a little boy, like, picking it up in a wagon and paying for it. Okay. And did you have any ideas on sounds or anything like that? No, I didn't. Okay. okay. So if we have anyone else kind of do more conceptual, any one project from a different angle than kind of whatever your protagonist in the nursery rhyme is? Go ahead. Cool. I can only teach her it up. Because <laughs> I did mine on uh, Humpty Dumpty, and I remember that to me Humpty Dumpty was actually, kind of like you talk about on the bridge and such, it was in reference to a canon mm -hmm. of British England. And uh, so that's kind of what I went with is uh, I started off music and then I introduce the poem and I have like a video of some sort with the egg that we typically kind of see with Humpty Dumpty and then do the poem and then I would move to images of, uh, if I could find an image of the can. Um, an image of the can that has some dialogue explaining the connection to it and that's where I put it. Okay. Hey. Go ahead. Uh, and we both did saying pretty little pigs, but I use my, I kind of use this story as an example for reframing because everybody knows the traditional three little pig story, but then if you know the other one told from the big bad wolf side of the story, and so mine kind of lays out that way. And so you introduce the big bad wolf that has allergies and he tries to get help from the three little pigs, just needs some allergy medication. And every time he gets close, he sneezes, they run away, they gather all the materials and he goes up to each house consecutively and sneezes and knocks the houses down. And then the last scene is the poor big bad wolf with his allergy attack and gets no help from the greedy little pigs that just pour all the medicine. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
looks away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was definitely more traditional. So the first block was the three different houses, three different pigs, and the big bad wolf. Um, light music, birds chirping in the background. Um, the second one is the destruction of the straw house, the little pig running away. Um, sound effects of the strong wind blowing, um, and then a little like I don't know squiggly noise from the pig running away in the background. Um, second scene is the house of sticks. Um, again, the sound of the wind blowing. Same noise, the repetitive noise of the pig running away, so that they're used to that. That. Um, what am I trying to say? Yeah, that's the effect that's identifying somebody running away. Um, last one, strong wind blowing. Um, the next one, the wind is lighter. There's the sounds coming back up of the birds chirping in the background like it's going to get better. He's not going to get this one. Um, and you can see all of them in the little house. And then the last one, they're all standing outside. The lighter noise is coming. You hear the wolf crying as he walks away. So it was a little more traditional, but. It was a terrifying They survived. <laughs> <laughs> Big bad wolf. Does anyone else want to share theirs? Or? Okay, let's, let's return to some of these different ideas. So did anyone really sh break up the text in a way you didn't expect or break up the, your version of the story in a way you didn't expect? Did they represent it from a different point of view? What, what did you guys learn from each other in this? And would you have any suggestions for anyone? Do you have questions? Kind of like, because we did see several different versions of different things. One thing I'm just going to say is that um, I really like to storyboard with students using post-it notes so that they can move them around and maybe they imagine different um, frame shots and then can take them in and out. Well, maybe after hearing other people's things, is there a way you might represent yours differently? Or if you just have one extra frame, what might you show your audience? Hearing people share was important for sure. I, I realized how literally I interpreted it and I heard other people like putting an, an interpretation on the story that I hadn't considered. Um, and so hearing that made that available to me if I wanted to rethink mine or rev revise mine. Um, I found myself wondering how I knew Humpty Dumpty was an egg. <laughs> and why I would put it in, in a grave, why would I bury the egg? I don't know. Um, so I was wondering those questions. I'm really curious about the cancer, because that's not a context that I know or do. Um, but here's another thing I noticed just about the process uh, of drawing and sharing. The first few people that shared apologized for their drawings, mm -hmm. and then there were some people that didn't draw at all. I'm curious about the people who didn't draw at all, how or why that happened. I have to put you on the spot. But, well, I had like an image in my mind of exactly what I wanted, but I knew I didn't have time to like sketch that out. So I just thought, well, I'll just write down the important details of what I'm looking for. I was kind of the same way. Like I had images in my head throughout the process, but I knew I couldn't put them on paper right. or at you, you know, and so. Yeah. And, um, so there's like an empathic moment there, right? Mm -hmm. Where I, I, I hear people apologizing and saying I can't draw, which is something we're going to be asking our kids to do mm -hmm. shortly, right? Um, I don't know. So. I uh, don't remember where exactly I got this from, but whatever I read talks about the importance of teaching your students how to draw before you ask them to draw. Mm -hmm. And um, I have had a blast. what works for the student. Um, but for the sake of data, I could be drawn with 
what would be the use, but yeah. So there are a lot of different ways you can adapt these kinds of exercises to really work for you in your classroom. But um, it is important to keep in mind because also too, like I assume you all do nursery rhyme, right? So like there's also a lot of assumptions sometimes in these storyboarding exercises we're going to make. Like if we're having everyone, oh, we're doing stories about aging or relationships or something, um, we're gonna have to keep in mind too, not everyone is going to have a the same sunny experience and that when they are storyboarding these things, they may have different takes on certain areas and that we want to keep that in mind when they are representing these things. But also too, yes, you're grading them essentially maybe on a story or time or something, but you know, just because it doesn't really match what we think it should be or it doesn't really lay out in a way we might expect that doesn't necessarily make it wrong. And we're going to have to be comfortable and flexible in thinking about those kinds of things when approaching that. So did anyone else have any questions or concerns think of something like that? I like how this teaches structure too because I teach theater and speech and so even when my students get up there and get a little 60 second impromptu speech, they still have to have a beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. And this kind of forces them to conceptualize what is the beginning and the end that I need to have and then what in the middle do I have to have, can I eliminate, and put in there, and then that overlaps through everything that they do, any presentation style. What's the beginning point that they need to set the reader up on and give us all the background detail and then where's your conclusion? And then you can fill up the middle part and this is a perfect way for the structure. They can break down literary text as to, okay, this is the key elements, the beginning, middle, and end, so they follow that proper dramatic arc. There was actually a story where they had, um, or a um, study where they had students to kind of come up with some of these exercises, like storyboard to kill a mockingbird in ninth grade classroom, and kind of seeing how the students interpreted the novel through that way. And they, you know, didn't give them a ton of panels, they only gave them a few minutes, seeing which elements were important to them to tell that story. So that was interesting as well. Does anyone other have ideas of how they might use in the classroom, other types of storyboarding activities that they've done, anything like that? I've used something like pretty much the same template for introducing um, the graphic novel concept for Green Mouse. Um, and because then, and I do like they have to use like a, a nursery rhyme or a fairy tale or something like that that they're familiar with, and then because they're only given six frames, then they, you know, I'm able to introduce them to like, well, how can you use dialogue to help, you know, since you only have the caption at the bottom, can you use dialogue to help and, and sound effects and stuff, and then, then um, that's like the precursor to when I introduce the actual graphic novel terms such as sound effects. up here next it's just a few different resources if you just google storyboard there are all sorts of options out there for you they've got all sorts of different online you can actually um, go onto websites that will let you pull from a kind of preset um, you know backdrop figure type of thing where it's really structured or there's things like canva which is almost in a way kind of just like a almost publisher type of thing where you can pull in images things for that you upload from your computer you can also make your own in PowerPoint which is nice because you can print those templates or you can have the students work in a PowerPoint slide and insert images, video, and lay it out that way. Um, and these are all in your packet there, so. Um, but these are just a few I could have listed for days. Um, the top two on here are um, mostly just printed templates, the other ones, and some of them have paid subscriptions, some of them are free, some of them have free trials, and also some of them have switched even in the process of me writing this, so. But there's always another one that crops up, so really there is no shortage of storyboards, it's just you have to investigate and see what works best for you? Do you want your students to have to draw from that specific thing? Do you want them to have to write it out themselves? Um, do you want them to make their own just from the beginning? So there's just a lot of different areas to explore and just figure out what works for you in your classroom. So. What was the one that you said that you used? I think it was called Storyboard That, and it came with like a 30 day free trial. Mm -hmm. So we just did um, trial memberships. Like the mm -hmm. students had to create those, but I put them um, into the system
about a lot of them do have also that you might have to take account for your students. So if that is a problem for your school, you might want to consider that. And I personally would recommend, honestly, maybe doing the PowerPoint type of approach, just because, especially if you're working with older students, that gives them a little bit more freedom. While it is nice sometimes to be able to upload and have things laid out for you, um, if they, they're comfortable in PowerPoint and can put that in the template, they can really adapt that to whatever they want. So there's a little bit of freedom there, and then they can also print those out and everything. So I just personally like that, but once again, it's a matter of what works for you and your students. If you can have those accounts and they're more comfortable working in some sort of more controlled environment, that sort of thing. So then the last thing I have here is assessment. These are just a few different sample rubrics for evaluating storyboards. Um, so as you can see, they really touch on the imagery, selecting parts of the plot, um, script, narrative, and kind of all these things we've talked about. Um, and making sure, once again, that we're showing, not telling. So these are just a couple of samples that I found in different digital storytelling and um, storyboarding books. Um, I liked this one because it just has a little bit of description about all of these different things that we have laid out. Um, but ultimately, there's also that line, like we mentioned, and we'll talk about it a bit more tomorrow, maybe it's the ethics of digital storytelling, about making sure that to some extent, yes, you are grading the content, you're really grading how it's laid out, but once again, you don't really have control over the story they're telling if you are asking these open-ended questions. So we're really trying to find a balance to that when you're working with your students. So that is the gist of that, but now we're going to be trying more sibling. Yes, Lauren, do you have a question? Um, is there any way that we can get a copy of this PowerPoint, um, like online? Um, the PowerPoints? Yes, we can put them on our probably conversation or, website. Yeah. Website yeah. We'll put them on the conversation website, but we'll make them public. I was going to print sample rubrics, but I jammed three copiers this morning, which is <laughs> why you're still going to be getting things handed out, even though we have folders. So. Well, I, I like to, like, some of the stuff that I, I like to incorporate in my own instruction of my students, too, and I think what yeah. you're sharing is really good. So. Yeah, we'll definitely do that.